Kia ora e welcome to this episode of Light Lunch. Today is a special day, we're International Women's Day, and um, we are joined by two or three very um, incredible women within the industry. Um, we've got Chloe here, who is Regional Events Lead at uh, the Institute Building, and we've got Colleen and Rebecca, from Narwick. I'm going to let Colleen and Rebecca introduce themselves because they are women of very many hats and yeah so Rebecca introduce yourself. Uh, hello I will keep it brief so uh, I'm obviously Rebecca. I work as a design manager for Somerset um, and then I tend to refer to Narwick as my voluntary part-time job mm -hmm. so I do that on the side um, outside and sometimes inside my job um, so yeah, I've been president now for a year and a half, and then we'll be uh, Colleen will be taking over. Very good. And Colleen, oh, I'm Colleen Upton. So I am the general manager at Hut Gas and Plumbing, and I've been here for thirty years. Um, and oh. one, what, yeah, <laughs> one of my um, uh, side jobs too is I'm the president elect, and some people don't know what that is. So basically, I'm like the apprentice president learning from Rebecca for Narwick. Yeah, no, and such good work going on um, with Narwick. So, you know, I appreciate both of your commitment to that because I know the time it takes when it's a volunteer role, it, you know, it does take up a lot of time. So um, well done, both of you. Um, so the light lunch will run today as we usually do. We'll have three hard hitting questions of what is keeping you up at, at night. Um, within the industry and then Chloe is going to take over and do the light and fun part where we get to know a little bit about Rebecca and Colleen and um, yeah so let's get started. Rebecca can you give us your first what is keeping you up at night when dreaming about yeah. the built environment? Uh, so cyclone and flood recovery is a big one for me. Uh, one of my projects is in Napier. Um, we were very lucky in that there was no damage in the cyclone. Um, but Napier has been a bit of a, a challenging area to source resourcing, um, mm -hmm. reliable and continual, I guess, subcontractors um, in that space anyway, I guess being a, a regional area. Um, so that was pre-cyclone. Uh, then the cyclone has happened, and obviously that's um, significantly stretched resourcing a lot more. Um, obviously, uh, the cyclones and the floods um, will present opportunity for the construction industry, um, but it's obviously a significant challenge in terms of those resources. Um, so that is yeah, definitely one of those challenges. Uh, and then my other two points... I'll go to Colleen oh, first sorry. and do a... <laughs> A one to one. Yeah. yeah. Is there any further? Um, you know. Sorry, getting carried away. No, no you're <laughs> from. I love it. Eager. <laughs> Colleen. Uh, so. This literally does keep me awake at night, and that's the current state of the apprenticeship system and the plumbing, gas, and drain laying industry. We were promised so much under Rove. Um, and what it would look like and what it would feel like and unfortunately in our industry I have to say the transition's been woeful. We have apprentices and I've got 15 apprentices and, and amongst my staff from year one it's a five-year apprenticeship from year one to year five but we've got apprentices staring down the barrel of six to six and a half years to finish simply because during COVID our ITO did nothing um, and it's a, it's a real concern at a time when things like Rebecca's talking about uh, in Napier and um, further up the country when tradespeople are going to be really needed and we already have a shortage, this is just making it worse. I mean, you could be a bloody doctor in the time it's taken to become a plumber. And so what are the main obstructions with that? I mean, is there something we can do now to help? Well, what so we're to Pukinga, who are now the overarching polytech, uh, it's just the transition. Mm -hmm. It's it's bureaucrats, it's policy analysts, it's just the transition was terrible for our ITO. I know some of the others that had a much smoother BC ITO, for example, they look like theirs was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, we need to have more tutors, we need to have more block courses, and we need to catch these people up and, and let them finish in five years. I mean, for anyone going into a job and it taking 
it's, it's because it's all cost to them, their pay rises, their qualifications, everything. So, yeah, yeah it keeps me awake at night and I file emails off all the time. I bet. Um, yeah, that's, that's guy. I really, when you think about the time, mm. not right. No. Or, oh, well. <laughs> Second point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my second point is the escalation of construction costs. That's been a, a, a scary one over COVID times. Just how much that's gone up, gone up in terms of how to um, how much it costs to build a building, yeah. or what the initial estimate on a building had been prior to COVID, to how much it actually costs to build now is, is terrifying, and how much it potentially will go up to as well is a yeah, it's a scary reality for the construction industry. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, is there anything into, because that is a huge concern, not only for the people in the industry and having to have those conversations, but people who are planning and... Well, it's actually, yeah, how many projects have, have there been that we're going to go ahead and then can't yeah. go ahead because I'm not feasible anymore, and then yes yeah, the end user that then misses out on what could have been an amazing facility or yeah and the, in the, in the community really, yeah exactly that yes. it affects because as, as, as you say Rebecca the um that it is potentially just going to increase as well that there's no yeah yeah to, yeah yeah, and it's not, and it's not just materials, is it? Too, because I, you know, again, my comment before about the apprenticeship system, because it's taking so long to get people through and qualified, we've got a shortage, yeah. and so when there's a shortage, the pay, you know, the wage mm -hmm. pressure goes on because they virtually can say, hey, we need to be paid more. We can't afford to lose them, and so, yeah, yeah pricing jobs is a scary prospect at the moment. Yeah, doing it and receiving it. Yeah. Things absolutely, yeah. yeah, a lot of pressure there. And Colleen, your second. So my my second one is is it does sort of speak a little bit to that, and it's around the retention. So our company was affected by Mainzeal in 2006. Um, we lost three hundred thousand dollars and came pretty close to shutting our doors because. All our work was for Mainzeal. We were doing five big jobs for them. So suddenly you've got 25 staff and no work for them to go to the next day. So we got over that um, at, at, you know, right. at, at personal cost. We all had to put, put money in, and, and that's the risk of being in business. But 18 months ago, the Mainzeal directors were taken to court and because there is a question about whether they've traded uh, while insolvent or, or traded properly. Um, and that's... 18 months ago and the judge reserved his decision and we're still waiting on it mm -hmm. you know 18 months so 2006 that's 17 years ago and then 18 months for this and it's just it's not good enough we, we shouldn't be having to wait that long you go for god's sake imagine if in all our jobs we took that long yeah i mean i know they've got to do it properly but 18 months really yeah there needs to be accountability as you well, yeah, because we're, because there may be, I don't think any of us are counting our chickens about getting any money, but, you know, if they're found guilty, then the director's liability insurance will have to pay out and, yeah. you know, all those businesses may, may get some money. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if they haven't done their job properly, then they should be punished for that. Yeah, there needs to be accountability. Um, well, but, you know, there, there were suicides, there were businesses that went under, all of that after that main deal collapse. And, and if it's found that they didn't act correctly, then they yeah. should be punished for that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yes, all right. Third one. This is <laughs> dire, isn't it? Yeah, my third point is to do with wellbeing. Uh, this is a um, one fact. Um, we've got a theme at now for our events for the year, which is wellness and wellbeing. Uh, we've very much recognised that for a lot of our members and really for our, our people in the industry in general, um, that obviously uh, with what we've spoken about before, there's a lot of challenges in the industry, um, rising cost of living, etc. There's a huge amount of pressures in people's lives and um, we've come out of you know, some challenging few years with COVID, etc. So mm -hmm. taking care of people's wellbeing and making sure that people are okay is, is a big challenge and I also want to do a bit of a plug quickly for mates in construction Please I'm do, yeah. a huge fan of the work that they do um, and I'm sure that probably a lot of you on the webinar are also um, fans mm. as well um, I very much want to encourage I, I feel like I'm a bit of uh, any opportunity and I'm waving the mm -hmm. uh, mates flag but 
Um, I very much want to encourage um, anyone to uh, get their site and their workplaces uh, trained up to do the general awareness training. To also consider doing connector training and getting their sites accredited. Um, the resources and the work that made still is phenomenal and yeah, I guess becomes even more important during these challenging times that we're facing yeah. in it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point and we actually touched on this, the last light lunch that, you know, no one can do their job. It's about the people. If you can't take care of your people, then, you know, there's no point. And so those sort of resources like what makes some construction have is that guide. If you don't know how to begin or where to start, that's where you start, right? That's, that's what they're there for. They're there to help, you know, put things in place for you if you don't know what to do. So yeah, good point. We will make note of that and put it in our, um, our follow-up email. Colleen, good point. So mine kind of dovetails into what Re Rebecca's saying and that, and that is, is about sort of the well-being of our um, tradeswomen. So hugely outnumbered and underrepresented on sites. I think across construction, 9% of uh, people on the tools are women. In the industry I work in, the plumbing, gas fitting, drain laying, 2% uh, of apprentices are female and our regulator is just starting to collect data on licensed uh, trades people. But I'm expecting it probably won't be much of a bigger percentage than that. And so uh, before I was the president-elect, I was the trades officer and, and I would get emails and phone calls from women. And it, what keeps me awake at night about that is, is the sexual harassment and the bullying of trades women on sites. Um, look, it can be just, you know, something said once, it's mean, said with intention, um, it's bullying, but it's it's that they go to work and, and, and there's inappropriate, you know, pressing up against them and then so that they're not sure was that intentional or have I thought about it and, you know, so am I misreading it? And then they go home that goes round and round in their head. And, you know, we have to stop that. We have to speak up and we have to stop it. And so for our for our men folk that are working on construction sites, um, they need to understand that silence isn't support and they also need to speak up. And you know, and then when that comment, because the next thing that flows when you do speak up is, oh, we never had to do that before we had women on here and oh, you've taken it the wrong way. And I admit that that actually that needs to be shut down too because that's, it's not okay. That's they, not they just want to come to work to do a job they love and they should be able to do that in a safe environment. And celebrated, not dead right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because because we belong in construction, right yep. across the board, we belong there. And um, yep. I, I there's something I I've, I've got a granddaughter who's 13 now, um, and my wish for her is to grow up in a world where she can choose to be the prime minister or a plumber, and gender doesn't even come into it. Yep. And I think. We, we want that for our sons, but they kind of claim it anyway. But you know, we 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 want it for our daughters, yeah, our sisters, our mothers, our, you know, yeah. our friends. Yeah, uh, say no more. I think I think that's a perfect way to finish part one because yes, it's um, everyone should be celebrated, and um, yeah. So on that, we this part two is getting to know both of you. So I'm going to hand over to Chloe, who's going to do some quick fire. A little bit lighter as well. Uh, what are we reading, listening and watching? Yeah, so watching, I'm really enjoying The Last of Us. Um, mm. Very fascinating TV show Yes. Um, on Neon. Um, I'm quite liking that a, a new episode comes out weekly for it, oh, although nice. I'm, I've been pretty terrible at uh, actually catching up. Um, <laughs> So I thought once I saw this question, I was like, okay, I need to actually make sure that I'm caught up. <laughs> um, last night I've watched the last two episodes, but yeah, it's a pretty um I guess at times confronting um given the post-COVID world we live in, but very interesting to be show. So enjoying it. And Colleen. I am I'm halfway through the first book of the Seven Sister series. Mm -hmm. um, which someone else recommended to me and I've been enjoying that and I've been watching Yellowstone on Neon where there's <laughs> lots of people get killed and the, and, and, and get it and we, when you ask me what my motto is you'll probably see why I like programs like that I really like it when injustice is, is sorted out pretty quickly <laughs> Amen Yeah, uh, my favourite show at the moment and yep. 
Ever. Uh, and look, I'm I'm going to say I love junk TV. By the time I've done a day at work and you've dealt with problems, that stick me in front of the Kardashians or anything where I can just switch off. I'd like to say I watch lots of documentaries, but I love trash TV. Yeah, I totally agree. That that's why I find it um, sometimes challenging to get caught up on The Last of Us because it's intense and it's yeah, once you yeah. have a work day, it's, it's good to just watch something that's mindless that you don't really yeah. have to be paying attention to. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, my husband's disgusted oh, in my television yeah. habits. Awesome. Good thing we've got several TVs around there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And what is something you're doing for your well-being? Yeah, so a big one for me is the gym. I love the gym. I'm always there. Um, it's very much something, though, that is uh, as much for my mental health as physical mm-hmm. health and well-being. Um, I find if I've had a really full-on day, um, we were briefly talking before, I'm learning to fly uh, a fixed-wing aircraft um, outside of you know, work, etc. Um, and I find after some of those lessons are so intense and I'm so far out of my comfort zone that I then go to the gym afterwards because it helps to kind of unravel all those mm, feelings of anxiety or stress or excitement or whatever, I can kind of untangle that big ball of emotion and, and feel a lot calmer and more relaxed and structured about it. And I guess the same goes for uh, after you've had a tough work day and there's a lot of things going on in your mind and all these balls that you're trying to juggle, it's good to go to the gym and just kind of work out a lot of that, that kind of stress and anxiety and challenge. So that's the one <laughs> And Colleen, what do you do for your well-being? Well, I clearly don't go to the gym, but I support people like Rebecca that do. Um, I I eat chocolate. My particular favourite is Caramello with a cup of tea. So you put a bit of chocolate in and then drink the tea over it. It slowly melts. Excellent. I drink wine. And and I'm going to put a plug in for Narwick because I tell you, there are days at the end of the workday where we've got a Narwick meeting. I think, well, can I be bothered driving into Wellington? But you go to those those meetings and I it is very rare where I don't almost skip out of them because you go there and you can be meeting with women for all ages you know all different ages coming and you can be talking about earthquake strengthening one minute menopause the next breastfeeding um, you know the cost of construction and it's it's a group of women who are very much cheerleaders that's what I like the most that, that some women will say something and others will come in and support and go, oh, you're doing a great job or you're doing this, this, this you know, and you, you come out of the air, I think it's good for your well-being. You can certainly come out of there smiling. That's cool. Really cool. Right. And what is your motto? Feel the fear and do it anyway. Good one. Yeah. And mine as a woman with an axe is far more interesting than a princess. No. <laughs> Very Yellowstone. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. And we have a little bonus question. Um, what is one piece of advice you'd give to the next gen? I would say a bit open-minded about what your career could look like. I'm very much one of those people who's had a, a bit of a winding path to get to the job that I do now. I think that there's a big emphasis on uh, trying to work out what you want to do in high school to then get on this like straight path, but you definitely don't need to. And I think very much in construction, there are so many opportunities and there are so many different roles that you can go to from one to another to to then change things up and explore different things. So yeah, being very open-minded about what your career could look like and also what the construction industry has to offer as well. I think for anyone considering a job in construction, um, there's a huge range of opportunities there, which I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted on. Yeah. <laughs> and and that, that's such great advice because I'm probably old enough to be um, Rebecca's mother. In fact, I'm probably pretty sure that I am. And so when I left school, the idea was you wanted, you know, to, to go for a job that you would do your whole 40 years at. That was, you know, that was what people did. And, uh, you know, I know with my own, I say children, but they range from 37 to 41. You, you're right, they have, you, you, that having one job and being in it till you retire is a, just not a dumb thing. And and, and or should it be? There's a world of opportunities there. I I, I think for young ones, especially, I'm thinking in the trades, for uh, is being persistent. Getting apprenticeships can be quite hard, even though there's a shortage. Often they're not advertised. Often they are, uh, oh, I know someone, or 
one of my guys at work knows someone. And so if you're wanting to get into that area of construction, it, it, be brave and be persistent. Don't don't um, get knocked back the first time they say, oh, we're not looking for an apprentice. Say, can I ring you in two months and just um, carry on? And like Rebecca, construction has such a wide range of opportunities for um, people. And, and, and again, I'll come back to the trades because that's what I know. You know, you can own your own business in a reasonably short space of time. You know, uh, mm -hmm. if you're a sparky, uh, you know, maybe four years in plumbing and gas after seven, you can be uh, running your own business, which is a is a great opportunity. And I think just on that, probably number one suggestion is join Nowick and yes. uh, you'll have this guidance yeah. throughout. And just to reiterate, obviously now we're an organisation that um, includes respect and supplies women, but we are very much welcoming of all genders. So Love it. we very much encourage men to come along, to join, to be supporters of the work that we do. So yeah, it's welcome to all. And we have obviously some fantastic events. So we'd love to, to see more members at those events. Well, thank you both. Uh, great way for us to all celebrate International Women's Day. And everybody else, you could join us next week. And we're talking with Mana Ashford and Kieran Davies. Yeah. Ka kite anō, everyone. Yeah. Bye.